joining us today in the latest in our Innovation at Work webinar series from MIT Sloan Executive Education. Uh, as I think most of you know by now, uh, we've moved to this new format of a really high speed 30 minute uh, webinar because uh, we're all trying to do so much more uh, and some of it, so much of it virtually these days. Uh, and this is a really exciting uh, format we found and I'm even more excited to be able to welcome today to the webinar uh, two outstanding guests, Ben Shields, who's a senior lecturer in managerial communications at the Sloan School, teaches in many of our executive education programs, uh, and Yath Ganga Kumaran, the director of strategy and business development from Formula One, who is uh, a great partner as an organization, and Yath is a great partner as an individual and as a leader uh, with us at the MIT Sloan School. Uh, and has indeed collaborated with us on a program uh, which we're going to be saying a little bit more about during the course of this webinar, which itself is incredibly exciting. Uh, Yath is, an, is a really major leader in his industry, uh, but also we have discovered as being a really great thought partner uh, in, in our programming that we're developing together. So we're delighted to bring Ben and Yath together for this, uh, for this webinar to talk about uh, some of the experiences that F1 has uh, been going through in particular in recent months as they rise to the challenges of the pandemic. So I'd like to hand over uh, shortly to Yath, but if we, to uh, Ben, but uh, as you can see uh, from the slide we're looking at at the moment, uh, not only are they both involved in the Formula One Extreme Innovation Series, but there are a number of books and courses uh, that Ben uh, and Yath are collaborating in uh, that may be relevant to uh, you if you find this interesting. So we encourage you to look at those. We'll send out more information after the webinar uh, and in the webinar, we're going to cover the four questions that we circulated uh, with the material, which I think is on the next slide, if uh, someone would advance the slides, please. Uh, we're going to uh, cover questions like, what's an organization's strategy? How does an organization strategy guide innovation activities during a crisis? What organizational dynamics enable innovation at speed? And we know how fast Formula One moves. And how can leaders foster innovation across multiple areas of an organization? So we're all moving together. Uh, so these are really interesting questions. I know that Ben and Yath uh, will help us with some great insights. Uh, please do continue to submit questions through the Q&A panel. Uh, I'll be monitoring those questions and later on in the webinar, we'll have a chance to ask Ben and Yath some of the, a few of the questions that, uh, that you've been asking. So with that, if I may, I'd like to uh, hand over uh, the camera as it were to Ben, who is hopefully appearing on screen, screen right now. Great, Ben, welcome. Uh, glad that you're here, uh, and please take it away. Peter, thanks so much for having me, and let me add my welcome to everyone who's attending from all over the world. Today, we're going to be talking about fast-tracking innovation and how Formula One is navigating the pandemic through innovative thinking and action. We spend a lot of time, as many of you know, on innovation here at MIT. Our definition of innovation here at MIT is the process by which we take ideas from inception to impact. It's that process from inception to impact. And so why do we study Formula One? Well, they have a distinct cultural of, of, of innovation at speed. They take ideas from inception to impact in a very fast manner. We also study Formula One because it's a complex global business. Prior to the pandemic, the Formula One season was going to be in five different continents and 22 different countries. And Formula One's also interesting to study because it's undergoing a business transformation under the new leadership of Liberty. So there's lots to learn about innovation by studying Formula One. I wanna take a quick pit stop for just a minute and explain broader context as to why MIT Sloan and Formula One are working together and exploring innovation at speed within the Formula One context. Peter had mentioned the Formula One Extreme Innovation Series where we take MIT management frameworks, explain them with Formula One case studies, and then ask, our participants to apply those principles of innovation to their own business. I wanna give you a quick taste of what the Formula One Extreme Innovation Series is, and then we'll talk about some of the innovations that are happening at Formula One during the pandemic. Thank <laughs> you. 
from the Formula One Extreme Innovation Series, and now I'm back with you. So what I'd like to talk about now is how Formula One is innovating during the pandemic. And I'm gonna bring Yath Ganka Kumar in here in a minute. To frame up some of the discussion around innovation, we can look at Formula One from three different perspectives. Innovation on the sporting side of Formula One, innovation on the commercial side of Formula One, and then innovation on the social impact of Formula One on our broader global society. We'll see examples from each of these perspectives, and some of them may overlap in how they serve fans more effectively. So I wanna bring Yath in here, and maybe Yath, first of all, thank you for joining us and sharing your insights and experiences while innovating during the pandemic. Let's, let's start with some discussion around some of the innovations on the sporting side. Now, clearly Formula One and the FIA have been working to introduce more competitiveness and unpredictability in the races. What steps have you taken to uh, work on these changes during the pandemic thus far? Thanks, Ben. Um, hi, everyone. Good to be here and looking forward to the discussion. Um, I guess in terms of the question around innovations that are happening on the sporting side, one that I think will have a major impact on the sport going forward is the introduction for the first time ever of a cost cap uh, into Formula One. Now, this is something that a lot of our um, US fans will be aware of, obviously happens with US sports, but has never happened in F1. And you've got some teams spending hundreds of millions of dollars more than other teams to compete. And in F1, the more money you spend, typically when you've got smart people working on these projects, the quicker, the more reliable your cars are. So introducing a cost cap for the first time ever will allow us to build a more level playing field and also ensure financial sustainability for the teams. And that's something that during this pandemic, we have been able to get all of the teams from the likes of Ferrari at the top end through to some of our smaller teams to agree on. And that's coming in next year at $145 million a year, which is lower than what the teams were looking to, uh, to have. So that's been a real win for us during the pandemic that will, from next year onwards, allow us to have a more competitive series on track. And it sounds like some of these discussions, yeah, were happening prior to the pandemic, but because of the environment of the pandemic and some of the, the pressures on industries around the world, you almost accelerated the decision-making around the, the cost cap. Yeah, I think that's right. And that's something I'm sure we'll talk about later in terms of bringing the whole ecosystem together for greater social good. I think one of the great things that has happened in this pandemic is that the teams have put, put aside sort of individual objectives to come together for the greater good. That's great. So that, that's one example of innovation on the sporting side the introduction of the cost cap. Let's look at the commercial side of Formula One and, and some of the innovations that are happening around there, especially given the fact that for at least the last few months, we've now had three races under our belt, but for the last few months, there's, there's been no racing. So, so how has Formula One innovated on the commercial side, not only to drive lines of business, but also perhaps to enhance the fan experience? Yeah, it's a great question. I think you know the, the big challenge for us is without our core products, which is the live racing on track, how do we continue to engage our fans at a time when they were expecting races? And what we have done is really elevate what we do on the esports side. So create, creating virtual races involving for the first time ever our actual Formula One drivers, but also to try and make it a bit more applicable to a more casual audience 
involving celebrities and sports stars from from other sports um, to take part alongside the F1 drivers, putting that on all of our social channels as one would expect, the likes of YouTube, etc. But also working with our more traditional broadcast partners, the likes of ESPN in the US, the likes of Sky over in the UK, to put this content on as if there were a live physical race happening on a Sunday afternoon. And that's been hugely successful for us. You know, we've had over 30 million people tune in to the different virtual races that we've had. And interestingly, actually, some of our F1 drivers themselves have said that it's actually helped hone their skills ahead of the start of the season. And you've seen the likes of Lando Norris do really well, actually, on track in the last few weeks. And he said some of that is down to the virtual racing. So that's been a nice win on the, on the commercial side around innovation and increasing fan engagement outside of racing. And it's interesting that some of the drivers like Lando are, are reporting that it's actually helping their performance on, on the track as well. Yeah, the esports example is really interesting because it's, it's one of those examples that could have a long lasting legacy. Now that you're back to racing, what, what do you think the future of esports will be within Formula One, even though we now have um, racing live on, on the circuit? Well, I think, I think esports has the potential to impact sort of two different areas. I think the first is actually in time, could we have a virtual esports championship that mirrors the physical championship that we have? And can it mirror the different revenue streams that we see from um, our virtual champ our physical championship, those being the likes of media rights, revenue, sponsorship, licensing, etc. Can we create new stars who are esports drivers alongside our physical drivers. So I think that's going to be really interesting to see how that develops in the years to come. I think the second is more around actually um, the funnel through which people come through into Formula One on the driving side. Esports is a much cheaper, more accessible entry option for young people to get into driving. We've seen that there is a correlation between virtual driving and physical driving. In fact, one of our esports drivers is now in a Formula 3 car racing um, in the World Championship there. And so that's really interesting for us because as some people will know, casting is very expensive. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's not like soccer um, where it doesn't really matter where you're from. If you're talented, you will, you, know, you will make it. Here, you really do have to be, at the moment, you know, the child of very wealthy parents to, to get through. Well, with esports, that changes the narrative because all you need is a console and the game to start playing. Um, so that for us is in some ways more exciting than sort of mirroring the physical championship. But hopefully we can get a whole new generation of people engaged in, in karting and then hopefully getting through to Formula One. Well, that, that's fascinating to hear about your efforts about building a business around esports and mirroring some of the revenue streams like media rights or sponsorship and attendance that we see in, in the live physical racing. And your point there about building the pipeline. Uh, for future racers and the future is, is quite inspiring as well. I, I want to turn to the third area of innovation that has been happening in Formula One during the pandemic. And to be clear, Formula One has had social impact for many decades. There's, there's always been this notion of what Formula One does on the track could have broader impact in our global society. But there's been some interesting efforts on Formula One's end during the pandemic that are noteworthy. Yeah, can you walk us through those efforts so that we understand what Formula One's work has been in social impact during the pandemic? Sure, yeah. So we, with the curtailing of our season uh, at the beginning of March and the fact that we weren't going to be racing for at least several months, we had a group of people who are highly talented on the science side, on the engineering side, um, essentially with, with not too much work to do because there was a shutdown in terms of um, what development they could do on the cars. And so we got together as a group and said, well, hang on a second, can we use the incredible brains that we've got within Formula One and the processes and the systems that we use to, to implement innovation at speed, as you talked about at the beginning of this session, can we take that and, and apply that to the coronavirus crisis um, that we're seeing in front of our eyes? And so the teams, we created a, a project group, it's called Project Pit Lane, and the teams um, got to work, working together for the first time to develop breathing aids and shielding equipment for clinicians. And some incredible examples of innovation um, on the social side coming through. So Mercedes 
built a breathing aid within 100 hours, um, something that would have taken two to three years if, if done uh, in the traditional means. And they didn't just build a prototype that worked. They built it, it was approved by uh, the NHS, and they created 10,000 of these in a very short space of time. So this was actually out in the field, helping doctors and nurses, helping the people who are in intensive care. I think we've um, created over 20,000 of these different breathing devices that different teams have created that have gone to um, health services across Europe. And to highlight, again, how this is more around social impact rather than doing anything for a, for a profit here, all of the, those innovations were made open source. So anyone around the world could go and copy um, those designs and then, and then uh, manufacture them and then put them to use around the world. And I think that was a fantastic example of the potential that F1 has, given the sort of brain power that we've got here the processes and the skills and the systems that they implement on a daily basis to innovate, to essentially be quicker on track, how that can, that can be applied on a wider um, social sphere. And I think that's something that's, that's an arm of our, of our sport that I think is only going to grow in, in the months and years to come. Yeah, it is a really interesting example because it shows how Formula One could be part of the solution to the pandemic. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I want to now step back and, and ask the question, well, what can we learn from these examples of innovation at speed? We heard about the, the cost cap being approved quickly. We heard about the advent of esports and what that could be for the future of Formula One. And then we heard about the efforts of Formula One teams coming together to help fight against the pandemic with ventilators and other aspects. Yeah, I want us to reflect on, on a couple of these points. Now, you're, you're a strategy and business development head for, for Formula One, so I want us to reflect on the role of strategy in, in, in innovation during a crisis, and I also want to reflect on some of the, the organizational dynamics and, and processes that enable innovation at speed. What, what can we learn about how Formula One can move so quickly to innovate that we can then apply to our organizations? Uh, share some of your reflections on these two points. Well, I, th I think one of the things that Chase, as our CEO, allows from the whole organization and, and the different department heads is a lot of autonomy. Um, and where there is a, an idea that is viewed as positive, he will let people run with it. So um, to give an example on the Project Pit Lane um, ventilator project, that came from our motorsports team that came from actually people from, um, from the wider ecosystem. They started getting to work on it, you know, told Chase about it. He said, it's a great idea. Keep running with it. Um, so there wasn't a sort of a very long bureaucratic process, you know, almost going through investment committees to try and get to an agreement on this is what we're going to do. You know, with the, um, the virtual racing, I believe, although my esports team might shout me, shout at me if I've got this wrong, I believe, that idea came from a few fans on Twitter tweeting out, well, there's no um, Bahrain Grand Prix. Why don't we do a virtual Bahrain Grand Prix using the esports game? Um, and from that, I seem to remember a deck which had a copy of the tweet in the PowerPoint saying, right, this is a great idea from a fan. Let's go and develop it. And the viewers, yeah, great, go for it. Um, as opposed to a really long bureaucratic process of, well, let's work out the ins and outs of it. How's this gonna work operation, et cetera. We sort of, if there's a good idea, um, and the people in the know, if, if it's their specialist area, think it's a good idea, then we typically let them run with it. So I think there's this point around empowering um, from sort of top down, being open-minded. So that idea around esports didn't come from within the organization. It came from a fan and we were willing to listen to our fans um, and then implement against it. And I think this whole point around being agile as well. I think one thing we haven't spoken about is the calendar um, that you will have seen is obviously chopped and changed quite a bit this year. And you've, you've, you've seen one new track uh, be announced. There's going to be some additional ones being announced in the coming weeks. That has all come about from us being agile to say, OK, well, let's let's look again at our race promotion business model. How do we get to a place where we are having a, a meaty enough um, calendar? Do we need to look at the way that we do our race promotion deals differently during the pandemic to allow us to, to meet our wider obligations? And as I said, you're starting to see there's some slightly different tracks coming on board as well. So being agile in your business model, um, I think also helps. Yeah, I think there's some really helpful points there around 
empowering your organization, the leaders within your organization to uh, take some risks at times. Uh, we, we also heard about the importance of an ecosystem. Formula One exists in an ecosystem with the uh, Formula One organization, with teams, and also with fans who can be a, a valuable source of feedback. And then we also heard about your point around agility and that enabling innovation as well. Something, other, something else that strikes me about Formula One, it, it, it's, it's fast moving. It's fast moving. Uh, there's, there's this constant uh, move toward the next thing. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that from a, from a cultural standpoint and, and how that, that affects innovation uh, across the ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, I think, it, it, to be honest, a lot of it comes from the teams and that they're innovating every single day, often just to stand still in terms of uh, where they are on, on the grid. You know, we'll, they'll completely rebuild cars um, year to year versus sort of incremental change. Um, and I think we're trying to take on the best of that from a business perspective. Clearly, you don't want to throw away, you know, rip up the rule book uh, from the past and, and start afresh all the time. But we're very much of the view that this was a, an asset when Liberty Media bought it that was a huge potential, amaz amazing heritage, but was potentially not fit for the 21st century. Um, so essentially what's been done is we've put new organizational structures in place, place new teams in place, people with the right skills. Um, and we've said, look, we want to move into certain spaces. We want to move quickly. We're going to learn as we go along. There might be a few hiccups along the way, but ultimately the direction of travel is is correct. And I think hopefully, you know, if you look at all of our key metrics around viewing figures, fan numbers, social media followers, revenues, profit, etc., they're all moving upwards, um, which is suggesting that that approach of, you know, trying to innovate in lots of different areas, never settling, never feeling like what we have right now is good enough, has allowed us to, you know, to reap the rewards. Yeah, that, that's really helpful and interesting insight about a lot of the innovative DNA coming from the teams. And you drafting off that to a degree makes me think about for other organizations, are there innovative teams within your organization that have a, a DNA that, that could then be extracted and applied throughout your organization? Just something for all of us to think about. Peter, I know we've got uh, a few minutes left uh, I, and I see a lot of questions coming in from the chat. Curious if there's uh, any questions that, that we should raise here within this discussion. Yes, thanks, Ben. And, and yeah, everyone has been commenting on how fascinating and valuable this is. Let me just <clears throat> ask a couple of uh, interesting questions I've been spotting in the stream as they come through. One is really aimed for Yath. Uh, at, fascinated by the description of how you're really adapting your commercial strategy. Uh, are you uh, also looking at opportunities that this sport might have to uh, take over audience share from other sports that may not be able to, to respond uh, as, as well as you're responding? And Ben, that's kind of a strategy question for a business as well, I think. Yeah, I, th I think on that, um, I think there's a lot of first mover advantage when it comes to sports restarting. So the Bundesliga, the German Football League definitely saw audience uh, share increases because it was the first major sport to come back, UFC to a lesser extent. Um, I think now that you're seeing most of the big sports come back, that you're probably sort of more getting back to where things were. I mean, we're up year on year uh, versus uh, since we restarted. Um, I think a lot of that is probably pent up demand. Um, I, you know, be interesting to see how that translates across the year. But I think we're, we're less worried or less focused around what other sports are doing um, and to try and grab audience share. We, we actually just think more generally we're competing not just with sports, but with all other forms of content. Um, so we're competing with and partnering with, interestingly, Netflix, with YouTube, with user-generated content, et cetera. And so for us, what we need to do to ensure we're front of mind and people are consuming our content as much as possible is ensure we've got a really exciting product. And even if, we, even if the product isn't as exciting as it could be, how do we tell the story in a way that engages lots of people? Um, so, you know, you just look at on track, yes, Mercedes have won for the last several years, but actually the way the story has been told through, you know, Netflix series, through what we do on digital and social has improved. And I think that helps us in terms of getting people to engage with us more. And as I said earlier, you look at our sort of viewing and follower and fan numbers and they're, they're all going up. Yeah. And I would just say quickly, just from my, my research, this fits into a larger fan acquisition that organizations like uh, Formula One and others fan acquisition strategy to bring more people into the market. And Yath mentioned the Netflix series, for instance, 
drive to survive, where you're bringing in casual fans or perhaps non-fans and increasing the intensity of their avidity so that they actually might become uh, better fans, stronger fans and watch races uh, in the future. Great, Those, the, that makes sense. We've got two more minutes left, so I think I can fit another question uh, in. Uh, and this again, I think is, to, uh, is really to both of you. Uh, and there's a lot of fascinating in the fascination in the questions about this, uh, the, the way that you've really introduced the E dimensions, whether it's eSports or the digital ways of, uh, of working, of, of extending the business. Uh, and, and maybe you could just sort of expand a little bit more on uh, as the physical sport returns, this idea of this is now a blended world where the digital and the physical are much more uh, intertwined. And do you have any predictions about where that's going to end up, including maybe, you know, what do we get to the point of driverless races, for example? Yes, yeah, so a good question around um, driverless races. I do think that a lot of the engagement that fans have, or I guess the emotional connection that um, fans have with sports is attached to the athletes. Um, now with F1, a lot of people will follow a particular driver. If you're if you're Italian, you typically will support Team Ferrari. Um, but typically, you know, if you're I'm British, I'll support Lewis uh, and, and the British drivers. I think there is a big thing around the driver as a personality. Um, so I do think they'll still, you know, we're still going to have F1 races with with actual uh, physical drivers there. You know, in terms of where esports goes, we're we're enjoying the ride. I think we're trying to get, as you've seen, uh, you know, from what I've said, we're trying to innovate and, and to make it a more self-sustaining um, part of our business. I don't think in the next three or four years you're going to see it competing in the same uh, way as a sort of a, a physical championship on the sort of commercial side um, and on the engagement side, but it, it will continue to grow. And I think the jury's still out in terms of can esports long term end up becoming you know their their own sports uh, their own sports series um, in a way but certainly where it continues to invest and support it um, in case it does um, but also we know that for now it's doing a really good job in terms of engaging with a much younger audience for us and a different audience that we typically see great thanks and ben maybe our last word to you and perhaps you could just touch on what has also been a line of questioning here and our yeah, has mentioned it the purpose beyond profit uh, and some of the broader social impacts uh, and perhaps also environmental impacts that uh, this kind of extreme innovation uh, opportunity presents. And, you know, I think this is just important for all of us at MIT as well. It's one of our core values is to uh, have a positive impact in the world. So Ben, if you could close up with a thought on that, uh, that would be wonderful. Sure. I mean, for all the sports fans out here, this thought might not uh, be new to you, but there's always been this notion that sports kind of exists in a vacuum, that they're just an entertainment, they're a distraction. I think what we're starting to see is more and more people around the world see sports organizations as social and cultural institutions. And playing that role in our society means not only driving a profit, but also leaving our society better off through their efforts. And I think Formula One has uh, demonstrated that certainly through Project Pit Lane about the potential of what sports organizations can do to make our world better. Thank you, Ben. I think that's a very positive note to, uh, to end on. Uh, thank you both to you, Ben Shields and Yeth Ganga Kamaran. Uh, we've really enjoyed having you here with us in the webinar uh, today. I'm sorry the time has gone so quickly. It seems to do that uh, on webinars as much as in races. Uh, but we're very appreciative of your time uh, with us uh, right now and all of you around the world who have uh, joined us. We will be uh, sending out a recording uh, of this so that people can rewatch it or share it with their friends. Uh, and we'll try to follow up also on some of the other questions that we've been receiving during the course of the webinar. Thank you all. It's been a pleasure. Look forward to seeing you all again soon.